We are bringing on Kevin Gasola to talk about Julian Assange. And before we bring him on, we're going to be playing a video, uh, a CNN video about Julian Assange. Assange's argument for not being extradited to the U.S. Uh, there are several. Uh, one of them at the most basic level is that he has um, some mental health issues uh, and a concern that he may take his life if he's uh, moved to the U.S. to face trial. Another is that this is politically motivated. He was just a journalist doing his job, so it would uh, breach his human rights if he was uh, transferred to the U.S. Quite extraordinary claim now coming in uh, just in the last hour or so that his lawyers have presented to the court. Uh, obviously, we need to investigate this further, but this is always all presented in open court. Uh, uh, according to Assange's lawyer, there is compelling evidence now in existence that senior CIA and U.S. administration officials requested a detailed set of plans and drawings of the embassy, the Ecuadorian embassy. You'll remember he was holed up in for all of that time. And they are suggesting um, that President Trump at the time himself requested options and sketches were even drawn up. When we're talking about options, the legal team is basically suggesting that there was evidence of a CIA plot to kidnap or ass assassinate Julian Assange. Uh, these are extraordinary claims. Well, there are a lot of new details coming out. And again, those, those uh, accusations have to be verified and looked through. That's fascinating because they're presenting that as breaking news. That's actually a story that was covered on this very show. Uh, it was covered at the Gray Zone, and I had Max Blumenthal on to talk about it. I know that our next guest also talked about it. It was written about in El País and also Yahoo News. And someone who can talk more about that uh, and about Assange in general is our next guest, Kevin Gastola, who curates the dissenter. He's the author of Guilty of Journalism, The Political Case Against Julian Assange, and he's the co-host of the podcast, Unauthorized Disclosure. So welcome, Kevin. It's good to be with you again. Good to talk with you. They just presented that news story about uh, the CIA having a plan to kill Assange as if it were breaking news. What, what's the backstory there? <laughs> Clowns. <laughs> That's the backstory. The backstory is this is the U.S. press that doesn't typically cover this case. So I'm left wondering if they really just don't know because that guy's not been covering Julian Assange's case or if there's something else going on where they're trying to make it seem like uh, Julian Assange's uh, lawyers are being conspiracy theorists and trying to make up some kind of narrative to make it look like the U.S. government is crazy evil. But the fact is, that that story that Yahoo News did, it included some details that were from the gray zone, but it also had a lot of new details about Mike Pompeo and how unhinged he was and just the fact that he was absolutely embarrassed that Donald Trump, he was going to have to go to him and say, oh, guess what? There's been this massive leak. WikiLeaks is publishing files from the CIA about our cyber hacking abilities. And I'm uh, sorry, I'm sorry I lost control of these files. And uh, that he wanted to take out all of his anger and rage on Julian Assange. And he gave the speech, one of the, like the first public speech that he gave, it was, half of it was all about WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. It was, it was insanity. And so, um, these people, the journalists that did this, they're reputable individuals. Now, the idea that CNN doesn't right. know that Michael Isakoff, who was a big, huge Russia gate guy, that he wasn't working on this, credibly speaking, right? Is, it's not just it's a great unfathomable, job. unfathomable. Right. And can you explain because that's that CNN piece didn't do a great job of it? Explain the story about how the CIA looked into uh, killing him. The story is that Mike Pompeo is uh, with other high-ranking officials asking for plans, sketches of these plans. So how could we do this? Well, one idea was let's kidnap Julian Assange. Uh, and by the way, there's this company called UC Global. It's a Spanish security company. They were contracted to provide the security for the Ecuador, for Ecuador's embassy. Rafael Correa actually brought them in. And actually, it turns out that Rafael Correa was targeted by UC Global, and that was also passed on 
and, and hand it back to the CIA. So he's in there and he's saying, what if we leave the door open? The idea in UC Global was like, just leave the door open. And then I guess some agents or even police can just come in, take Julian Assange and haul him out of the embassy. And they say, oops, we're sorry, we left the door open. Uh, they talked about poisoning him potentially, which to me just harkens back to or evokes memories of the many, there were numerous plots, crazy plots for trying to kill Fidel Castro when he was, um, or also that's how they, uh, for Patrice Lumumba, who was the Congo um, president, that was that the idea was that he could get poison toothpaste. That was something the CIA developed. So I'm thinking maybe they would have done like poison toothpaste for Julian Assange or something like that. So then they could outright kill him. Um, and actually, they were seriously considering rendition for Julian Assange. The Justice Department was afraid. One thing that isn't exactly appreciated about this story about what the CIA was doing to Julian Assange is that the Justice Department freaked out and that actually, Pompeo knew what he was doing by saying that the CIA was going to get involved in this way. They were, you know, you talk about this rules-based order, which is a joke, but the Justice Department was saying, oh no, Julian Assange is going to arrive in the United States and we're not going to have an indictment against him. So we need to scramble and get something together. And they actually did. And then there's this drama around um, Christmas time when the Ecuador was going to give him a diplomatic passport and try to get him out of the embassy. And all this surveillance that was happening with CIA support, they knew that he was going to leave. So they basically kind of intimidated the lawyers and, and, and got them to understand that if they tried this now, Julian Assange was going to be arrested because they had figured out through this surveillance that he was going to try to leave the embassy. And then from that point on, they were, there was an international arrest warrant and he no longer could exit the embassy uh, because of that. So tell us where we are in this case against Julian Assange and his extradition case. The uh, way things are going today, I mean, the, the hearing was an opportunity for Julian Assange's lawyers to go into the high court and say that they would like to appeal the extradition. Uh, we're hoping that this high court will grant a full appeal he sorry a full appeal hearing otherwise what that means is there is no route for Julian Assange in the UK legal system after today and it almost virtually guarantees that he's going to be extradited to the United States so they were putting on um, a lot of this like really important evidence primarily all the things they were saying related to how they believe the district judge, her name was Vanessa Baretzer, didn't give this the attention it deserved. And when they when she was told things like, this is a politically motivated case, Donald Trump uh, let Mike Pompeo and Jeff Sessions run amok and go and turn the Justice Department into this institution that would target people who were exercising their First Amendment rights. You know, she was just like, well, I don't see that. I think they've been following a process and it's been fair and I'm not going to do anything to save Julian Assange. Although she did get to the part where she saw this glaring evidence about how U.S. prisons and jails treat people here in this country. And they then she ruled that it would be oppressive for mental health reasons to extradite Julian Assange, which gave us a kind of surreal moment where it looked like Julian Assange could win. But the U.S. quickly remedied that by printing these lies on paper about how they would take care of Julian Assange's well-being if he was brought to the United States. So they basically, she was basically saying the prison system in the United States is so abusive that someone with mental health issues can't survive. And they're like, don't worry, we promise we're going to be nice to him, even though yeah. their promises were ridiculous. Yeah, and he, uh, we heard evidence back in September 2020 about how he was diagnosed with autism, or he's on the autism spectrum. and. Uh, these various issues that he has and after psychiatrists have you know, gone through therapy sessions and all of the trauma that he's gone through, being in arbitrary t detention, uh, just so people are familiar fully with the saga, we're talking about going all the way back to the end of 2010 that he's been in detention in some form or another, whether it was house arrest or being in the London embassy, that the Ecuador's London embassy. 
And then uh, in 2019, he's been for five years in this Belmarsh high security prison that is often referred to or sometimes referred to as Britain's Guantanamo. And he had a stroke. He had a stroke. And recently we learn from Rebecca Vincent at Reporters Without Borders, who has been able to visit him finally like three or four times, that he had excessive coughing around Christmas and uh, he coughed and coughed and broke a rib because he suffers from osteoporosis. Now, people, as I shared this information with them, were reacting appropriately. And they thought, that shouldn't happen to somebody who's 52 years old. But if you know health, physical health, someone who is not able to go out and get sunlight right. and get vitamin D, D, their bones are going to deteriorate like this. And that's what's happened because of the cruelty. He does not have recreation outside regularly in Belmar. And he did not have any ability to go outside when he was in the Ecuador embassy because, well, he was stuck inside. And if he left and went outdoors, the British police were going to snatch him up. Biden said last week, uh, Putin is responsible for Navalny. So by that logic, of course, Biden is responsible for his stroke, for his osteoporosis, for his broken rib, for his torture, because the special rapporteur on torture has declared after examining Julian Assange, and this is a guy who was resistant to look into Julian Assange's case. He thought Julian Assange was a despicable character. Um, he finally looked into it and decided, and he was not prejudiced towards Assange, he was prejudiced against him, and, but he just looked at the facts, and he's a special rapporteur on torture, Nils Meltzer, and he determined he was tortured. Yep. So That's what true. can people do? I mean, there's not a lot of time left, so what can people do? What can be done is forcing a political solution. Uh, we first have to understand, and I think most of your viewers will have a tough time because they're in tune with this issue a lot better than most viewers and Americans and others throughout the world. The legal system is not going to spare Julian Assange. So we don't wait for anything to happen. Yes, I can tell you, I could sit here and tell you all about how the European Court of Human Rights could hear Julian Assange's appeal if he doesn't get to have an appeal in the High Court of Justice. But then that's like three, four more years of his life that he might spend in prison if they even take it up. So what people need to know is that we have to keep calling out this hypocrisy uh, in the same way that people are connecting the dots and making the right conclusions about the brazen exercise of power happening by Biden in Gaza or against Gaza or by supporting the Israeli government. You know, and we're seeing what's happening to 120, 130 plus journalists of basically been exterminated by the Israeli government or the Israeli military. We need to make the connection here that this Biden White House and the way that they excuse the actions of the Israeli government, it's the same way that they excuse the actions of the Justice Department right now. And we're essentially seeing a slow motion political assassination of a journalist. And, and once you understand that the deflection and the unwillingness to take responsibility comes from this coldness among the Justice Department. Because mind you, these aren't even the people who indicted Julian Assange. These are just right. the people who entered the Justice Department after Trump and said, you know what, we kind of like the idea that we might be able to put Julian Assange on trial. And that actually makes them worse, in my opinion, because they Trump. didn't... They, then, yeah, it makes it makes them worse than Jeff Sessions and Bill Barr and the people underneath who actually formulated this plan to get Julian Assange expelled from the Ecuador embassy and bring him to trial in the United States. Because because they don't even really have a commitment to it. They just inherited it and they right. said, well, we don't really feel like doing anything different. We're just going to continue with this business. And when you ask them questions, as reporters try to do, they get the same kind of deflection and spin and ridiculous nonsense that you're seeing from Matthew Miller right. on Gaza. And in fact, Matthew Miller is a character in this story. People may not know, but I know Matthew Miller because Matthew Miller was the guy who was a former spokesperson of the Justice Department and in 2013 told the Washington Post to help them with their reporting 
that, yes, the Obama administration had uncovered this New York Times problem. You might have heard about this. The New York Times problem was there's no way to prosecute Julian Assange without also prosecuting Washington Post, New York Times, and The Guardian, these newspapers that also had published the leaks just like Julian Assange. And so now we have Biden. Biden was vice president in the Obama White House. And this departure, it's it's incredible that this is something he's sticking with. But right. even more disheartening, and this is where people come in, even more disheartening is that you have members of Congress that have introduced a resolution saying very basically, this is the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll add here on what people can do, because it is something they can do, but there's sort of like a, a bittersweet angle to it because we're not really clicking yet. There's not a lot of momentum and we need to change that so Julian Assange will be spared. There are 12 members of Congress that have signed on to this resolution, Republicans and Democrats, to say basically, the First Amendment protects freedom of the press. If you believe in the First Amendment, then we should drop the charges against Julian Assange and not extradite him to the United States. It's that simple. Only 12. There are 435 representatives in Congress. Anyone could sign on to it. Anyone could sign on to it at any moment. And that's what needs to happen. But for right now, we don't have a lot of sponsors. So we're left just sending these open letters to Merrick Garland. I don't think he needs another open letter. I understand that organizations, press freedom organizations, others, this is important work that they're doing, and I'm glad they're doing it. But Merrick Garland has probably received like 10, 12 open letters at this point telling him about the issues. He knows, and he's not doing anything to stop it. Huh. And uh, you know, we need to we need to move to Congress actually challenging the White House and this administration. Call him in for a hearing. Have somebody organize a hearing and do a review of how this has all been handled. What was the CIA and Justice Department doing? And why was Julian Assange ever even indicted? You know, we've been focusing on my show a lot on Israel-Palestine. And so a lot of people watching this obviously are very passionate about that. What did Julian Assange tell us about uh, Israel-Palestine? What did WikiLeaks reveal? Yeah, so some of the details are showing that uh, Israel, was, I mean, we, we obviously we know this now, we can see it, they're ready to just obliterate it and wipe it off the map. But there was a cable that talked about the deliberate uh, effort to keep Gaza on the brink of economic collapse. And, and that was something that they consciously wanted to do because it gave them the leverage that they wanted to control the population. We see details about one of the earlier operations, Operation Castled, in which uh, Israel actually told the Palestinian Authority, um, told uh, Egypt as well, beforehand what they were going to do. And uh, the P prime minister just sat back and didn't say anything about it so that um, Palestinians could flee or uh, take whatever measures necessary to not be bombed and killed. And uh, so that, that's another thing. We, we see a one cable that's uh, just, just shows you the cruelty. Uh, there's a discussion about how they're going to use skunk water, the, the, the dirty water that they shoot at protesters in the West Bank. And, uh, and then it rises to the level of farce just a little bit because they're worried that the Palestinian prime minister is going to go to one of these demonstrations and actually get attacked with skunk water as well. And that's not going to be good for them because they'll have to deal with the aftermath of his anger that he was attacked by the Israeli military forces. So, so that's in there. Uh, Netanyahu declared the Goldstone Report, uh, which was this review of the, it was, I believe it was Operation Cast Lead. And uh, it was one of the like top three threats. He was really upset about it and that there were going to be some kind of accountability for Israeli crimes. And uh, that's in the cables. And then there are some things I would recommend people look up. I'll just, I know he's been on this show. I'll direct you to it because it's a good little handy thing. Um, Asa Win Stanley uh, did a thing, uh, Insights on Palestine from the cables. And that's good. There's some good highlights. And uh, later he went back and grabbed some additional 
tidbits of, of some of the people who the cables exposed as being spooks who were working for the Israeli government or, you know, they have these nonprofit looking centers, but really they're working for the Mossad or something like that. And when is this decision going to come down? We believe that it'll be within days after this hearing. Uh, it, it would be fairly immediate because this isn't really a full appeal hearing. This is just the court trying to determine if they're going to even give Julian Assange an appeal hearing. And I would leave everyone with the thought that, yes, like when I read through the materials, it's not a debate that should be had. It's pretty clear. All the work that's been done by Julian Assange's attorneys show that no matter what side you're on, they show that like clearly you should give him a hearing and let all of these issues be aired out in the open. We not go through it slapdash and very quickly the way that we have today because we went through quite a bit it's a rather overwhelming and obviously we don't have time on your show tonight but even to just mention all the issues and to follow it like journalists have tried to follow it today in london it's a bit overwhelming because it's just this is a saga that has gone on for almost 15 years and we're talking about some extremely intense and deep issues with how cruel and just unreasonable the United States has been about this in every way.